The world needs statistics. More specifically, it needs people who can do statistics correctly. Despite its value, I'd argue that statistical knowledge is rare. People might only ever take one statistics course in their life and forget about it as soon as they turn in their final. Even for people who study statistics, it's easy to forget when you're balancing other things with your life. As a result, companies are willing to pay a premium to hire people who have these skills. If you're watching this video, you probably want to be one of them. But if it's been a while, or you're not that familiar with statistics, it can be overwhelming to know where to start or what to learn. The most efficient way to learn is to identify your weak points as soon as possible and fill in the gaps in your knowledge. So in this video, I wanted to create a new resource to help people diagnose their own statistics knowledge. I have five statistics questions that I feel all statistics users should ingrain in their heads. For each of these questions, I'll tell you what it is, give you a moment to honestly answer it, and then give you my take on a good answer. If you hear unfamiliar terms or concepts, then that's a good sign that there's something you should study more. It can feel bad to be faced with your own lack of knowledge, but remember that no one is here to judge you or grade you on your answers. Better that a stranger over the internet do it than someone else in the middle of an interview. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. Even if your self-esteem might be a little hurt in the process. Let's get started. What is a p-value? How do you interpret it? A p-value is a conditional probability, and I'm going to break down this conditional probability in terms of math notation. I know some of you might be uncomfortable with math, but don't worry, I'll make sure to translate all of the notation into language that's easier to understand. More specifically, it's the probability of seeing the test statistic you got, or something more extreme, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Note that it's not the probability of the null hypothesis itself, which unfortunately is a common mistake people make. This probability is derived from the test statistic, which has its own probability distribution. You might observe a test statistic small t that lands here. Then the p-value would be the area past your small t. What I've stated here is the general definition of a p-value, which is great if you already understand what a p-value is, but it shows more understanding on your part if you can translate it to specific situations that are relevant to your background or to the company. For example, I work in biostatistics, so I should be able to translate the p-value in terms of basic clinical trials. For a trial comparing a new drug against a placebo, the null hypothesis is usually that there's no difference between them. A sufficiently low p-value tells me that the data we collect is unlikely to come from a world where the two treatments work the same. It indicates that assuming that the null hypothesis is true is probably not a good assumption to make. But on the other hand, a high p-value doesn't confirm that the null hypothesis is true. A p-value can only act as evidence against it. But what does sufficiently low actually look like? Unfortunately, there's no black and white answer to this question. You've probably seen a 5% is a quote-unquote sufficiently low number, but this particular number has no special significance other than the fact that it's kind of low. In the eyes of a statistician, a p-value of 5.1% and a p-value of 4.9% convey essentially the same idea. 5% is just some number we use as a threshold. Like it or not, the p-value is something that all statistics users are taught to use. It's here to stay, but you can do your part to make sure that you and others around you use it correctly. What is a type 1 error? How do we control the probability of a type 1 error, and when might we want this probability to be higher or lower? A type 1 error is an error we can make after we do a hypothesis test. To understand this, you have to remember that all hypothesis tests end with the decision to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. On the other hand, there's the true state of the world. For our purposes, we'll frame it in terms of the null hypothesis. It's either true or not true. We don't know and we'll never know what the actual truth is, but we still need to define these two states. And what we get with our decision and the true state of the world is this decision matrix. A type 1 error happens when we reject the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is actually the true state of the world. Going back to my example about the clinical trial, a type 1 error would be declaring that the new drug is different from the placebo when in fact the two have the same effect. You might phrase this as a false positive decision. To change the probability of a type 1 error for our test, you need to change the level of your test which is usually denoted as alpha. The level is something we choose. It's a probability that we tolerate. When people think about getting a p-value below 5%, it's because a 5% level was used. You can set the level to something lower, like 1%, 
which makes it harder to reject the null hypothesis, and by extension, makes it harder to commit a type 1 error. Conversely, setting the level higher to say 10% has the opposite effect. You may wonder why we'd want to change the level in the first place. As with most things in life, the answer is consequences. Let's go back to the clinical trial example with an added wrinkle. Now let's say that treatment has side effects, and whether or not the treatment is effective, these side effects will still happen. For a relatively benign side effect, like a headache, a type 1 error is not that bad. Even if the treatment isn't effective, they won't be that inconvenienced in the end. If a type 1 error is relatively harmless, we might choose to set a higher level because it would let our hypothesis test have greater power. But now consider a scenario where the side effects are severe, severe enough to send someone to the hospital or even worse. Think chemotherapy. A type 1 error for a new chemotherapy would be awful. Anyone taking it would get all of the side effects with none of the benefits. In this case, we'd really want to be sure that the treatment is actually effective to justify the harms that come with it. This would justify setting a stricter level. In fields like biostatistics, sometimes people are the data, so that needs to be taken into account with hypothesis testing. What is power? Why is power a probability? Going back to that decision matrix from the last question, we saw that a type 1 error happens when you land in this cell. What we really want to do is land in this corner, where we choose to reject the null hypothesis when it's actually false. The probability that this happens is what we call power. You might be confused by the fact that there's a probability associated with making these decisions. You might think that if we have a treatment that works, then we should be able to correctly reject the null hypothesis every time. Nope. To understand this better, let's walk through a visualization. We make a decision about the null hypothesis based on a test statistic that we calculate from data. But since data itself is random, the test statistic will also be random. This gives the test statistic a probability distribution that I described earlier. Based on which hypothesis is true, the location of this distribution will change. For our purposes, let's say that this is the distribution of the test statistic when the null hypothesis is false. When we decide on a particular level for a hypothesis test, we're actually deciding on a special value called a critical value. If we get a test statistic that's more extreme than this critical value, then we reject the null hypothesis. If it's not, then we fail to reject. This region contains all the values of the distribution that are greater than this critical value, and would therefore lead us to correctly reject the null hypothesis. The corresponding area with this region represents the probability of observing the test statistic in this region, and thus represents power. But notice that there's a small region that's still smaller than the critical value. The probability associated with this region represents a small but non-zero chance that we fail to reject the null hypothesis even in the case where it's actually false. This is a type 2 error. What does getting a statistic here concretely mean though? Going back to the treatment versus placebo example, it's possible that the people who are put in the treatment group are just sicker than the people in the placebo group. This will make the treatment look much worse than it actually is, purely due to luck and not due to the treatment itself. Similarly, you might get healthier people in the placebo group. In either case, you just get unlucky with your data and get an unusually small test statistic. What are outliers and why are they concerning for some hypothesis tests like the t-test? Outliers are observations in the data whose value is significantly different from others in the data. What constitutes significantly different depends on what the data looks like, but it's kind of like porn. You know it when you see it. The reason outliers are dangerous is because they threaten the validity of a theorem that lies at the heart of several classic hypothesis tests. This theorem is the central limit theorem, which I'll refer to as CLT. Assuming that the conditions of the theorem are met, CLT tells us that the sample mean has a very convenient distribution, a normal distribution. Furthermore, CLT tells us that the sample mean will have this normal distribution no matter how the underlying data itself is distributed. In the end, we'll still have a reliable distribution to base our hypothesis tests on. And the sample mean is important because it's used to calculate the statistic for many classical tests. But like I mentioned before, there are conditions and assumptions needed for CLT to work. Outliers, or rather, having too many outliers, threaten these assumptions. Once the assumptions are invalidated, the results of any hypothesis test that uses CLT are invalidated. It won't matter what decision we make either way. That being said, there are hypothesis tests that account for the presence of outliers, so if you suspect that your particular problem will naturally have them, these should be considered. 
What is the idea of the long run in statistics, and why is it important? If you ever use statistics in your work, then I'd be pretty confident in predicting that you'll be using a paradigm called frequentist statistics, or frequentism. Frequentism is the main way that people are taught to use statistics in schools. Everything I've talked about in this video so far have frequentist roots. If you've been with my channel for a while, you know that I'm a critic of frequentism. But I'm also realistic. I know that if you want to be fluent in statistics, you have to be comfortable with frequentism. Frequentist statistics gets its name from the word frequency. One of the core ideas in frequentism is that probability should be fundamentally seen as a frequency. If you have an experiment, for example, a clinical trial or A-B test, and repeat it many, many, many times, then the probability that some event in these experiments will happen is just the number of times it happens divided by the total number of experiments. By definition, this requires that the experiment should be repeatable. The long run refers to the fact that this number of experiments in the denominator can be repeated many, many, you might even say infinitely many times. In the long run, patterns and probabilities will emerge from the data. If you were to plot the frequency of an event over how many experiments are used to calculate it, you'd see that it starts to level out at some number. You'd call this the long run frequency of these experiments. This is the law of large numbers in action. In most cases, we only ever perform one experiment, get one data set, and see one test statistic. But the idea is that we can theoretically repeat this experiment and be able to control things like power and type 1 error with these repeated experiments in mind. Whether or not we can realistically do that is up for debate, but when it is feasible, we all benefit from the solid mathematical grounding that it gives us. So how'd you do? Hopefully you got everything right, but maybe you found a few points that you could improve on. You don't have to go too far either. You can just watch the videos on my channel to brush up on these concepts. I'm always trying to expand the ways that my channel can be useful to my viewers, but since I don't talk to any of you, I'm not sure if it's useful to you. So if you want to see more content like this, or you have some recommendations to make it better, then let me know in the comments. If you've liked what you've seen here, I hope that you'll consider subscribing to my channel. I try to push out statistics videos every two weeks. You can also get videos sent directly to your inbox if you sign up for the channel newsletter. There, you'll get new videos sent directly to your inbox, as well as some behind the scenes content from me. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next one.